So today we're looking at pattern-based analysis and we're going to look at different ways of doing it and think about why you should and shouldn't do it. Shut up and sit down. Okay, okay, pattern-based analysis. Here we go. Now in this video, we're having a wee bit of a taster of four of the pattern-based approaches to qualitative analysis. And if you check out table 8.1 in your textbook, you'll see that each of these approaches has a number of variations that have been developed following different epistemological positions. So yes, it's complicated, but don't panic because this is an introductory lecture, we aren't going to worry too much about the variations for now. So it's week seven, we've got a bit of time to worry about that later, and we're not going to, when we do worry about it, we're not going to worry about it a lot, uh, much at all. Um, but we're going to explore the um, thematic analysis variations in more depth, and that's going to come over the next few weeks. But what I want to do now is just to give you an overview of what each approach broadly looks at. Um, what it looks like, how it can be done uh, differently, depending on your philosophical orientation and the similarities and differences between each of these uh, different forms of analysis. It's important to look at things differently. So thematic analysis means what it says. It's a method for identifying patterns across a data set. And in thematic analysis, these patterns are called themes. And our textbook identifies four different varieties of thematic analysis but for now let's just treat it as one approach and we can play with it a bit more later on. Now I've included a link here to an interesting paper that gives you an example of how thematic analysis is used. Now unlike interpretive phen phenomenological, <laughs> I knew I was going to trip over that. Interpretive IPA, interpretive phenomenological analysis, IPA and um, also Grounded Theory, uh, GT, and Discourse Analysis, DA, thematic analysis does not provide a th methodological recipe for your full research project. That is, it doesn't have a specific epistemological or ontological underpinning. It doesn't direct you in terms of the types of questions you might ask or the data you collect. So a key strength is its flexibility. However, because, it, because it's a method that sits outside of a wider theoretical framework, it doesn't provide guidance on how to interpret the data, i.e. how to go beyond just describing what people said, you know, to considering hows and whys of what people said. So thematic analysis is one of the most accessible forms of analysis, but one of the ones that's most likely that you can lose your way with because there are no clear signals as to which way your analysis should go. Now, I've taken an illustrative example from one of the readings available on the textbook's companion website. The article here explores the women, women's anger and aggression from a phenomenological perspective. And I've highlighted here just two things from the article, which shows what IPA does. The article reviews the existing literature on aggression from a quantitative perspective, which is directed towards measuring how much and what types of aggression occur. And this research suggests that indirect aggression is most often used by women. Now, a phenomenological study asks why, why is that? You know, um, why, why, why? What it, what it asks us is um, why is direct aggression used or preferred? You know, they're interested in what it means for people and in what context it occurs. The primary understanding that guides this research is a phenomenological one that uses pe that, um, that says that people use aggression. Um, and aggression happens in interpersonal contexts, and it's a response to what is happening between people and what's happening in the world around people. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. Now, I really recommend reading this article. It's a really interesting read, and um, it also illustrates IPA in a very accessible way. It's also an excellent illustration of developing a strong academic and social rationale for study through reviewing the previous literature. You know, the authors identify the limitations of the previous quantitative research for understanding anger. 
So let's have a look at IPA in a bit more detail. So the purpose of IPA is to engage in analysis of the particular rather than the general. The particular is how something is experienced by an individual, which is the research participant. And when recruiting participants, it's best to use purposive sampling. You know, people who have a particular experience you're interested in, and you generally want to get a small group of people who are fairly homogenous um, and quite similar to you know quite similar to each other. Now, this is again because the focus is on the particular rather than the general. So it could be the particular experience of indigenous women who are in their twenties, for example. And IPA can also be used in single case studies again because it's interested in the unique meaning of an experience for an individual. So they tend to focus just on individuals or small groups of individuals. Yes! We're all individuals! Not, it's not looking at large groups or societal issues. Now the methods that are best suited to IPA are semi-structured face-to-face in-depth interviews, kind of like the ones we did in the residential school. Less common would be focus groups, again because IPA is really focused on the individual rather than the group. An example of an IPA approach is research by ETUF, which involved five women residing in an area of the UK which experienced extreme social need. The women were of similar ages and were all in cohabiting relationships, and each woman was interviewed twice for the project. So where are we going with IPA? What's it trying to do? Well, it's a dual purpose. First, it seeks to represent people's experience in a way that's true to them. So this is like the descriptive analysis we talked about in part one of lecture four. Now, IPA gives it a fancy name, the hermeneutics of empathy. Hermeneutics means interpretation. So it's all about getting us as close as possible to the person's experience, to kind of walk in their shoes, if you like. There's also a second purpose, which is close to interpretive analysis. And here we adopt a critical perspective. And again, we call it something fancy. You know, we're academics, we call things fancy names. Here it's called the hermeneutics of suspicion. So we're interpreting what the participant says with a degree of suspicion. This doesn't mean we suspect them of lying, we don't interrogate them. But what we do is question why they're talking about their experience in a particular way. Remember, we're still operating outside of a positivist paradigm. So we don't believe that truths exist independently of us. So here, the truth of a person's experience is not an absolute truth, but it's socially, a socially constructed one. So what we do here is ask through our analysis why the participant is making sense of their experience in the particular way that they are rather than in another way. Now the outputs of IPA are the development of themes, similar to thematic analysis, but here we're looking for higher order themes, themes that have breadth and capture complexity. We then develop sub-themes within those broad themes. Now we'll have a look at some examples in a moment. First, here are the strengths and weaknesses of IPA. It, now it's nice and clear in relation to procedure, what questions to ask of the data in your analysis, but sometimes it's not wholly clear how we ensure we are successful with our humanistic hermeneutic interpretation of suspicion. Cool. So sometimes this bit works less well or it's neglected by some researchers and we can easily end up with a purely or a mostly descriptive analysis. Now, that's the risk that most people doing IPA um, suffer from, particularly students doing honours work. They can often just end up with descriptive analysis rather than interpretive analysis. We like to see both in IPA when it's done well. That description is not scientifically accurate. Now, another plus is that it's an approach that has been developed in psychology, and it's kind of tailor-made for psychological phenomena. But there are areas in psychology that draw on social, cultural and political context, and it's not obvious how we bring that into analysis. You know, we're focused so much on the individual that the broader social context might slip out of our analysis. But focusing on the individual is seen as a positive by some. Now that aside, it's a type of analysis that does not, analysis that does not take as long as some other forms. So if you have limited time, it's a good type of analysis that can throw up some interesting findings, you know, relatively quickly. 
but because it's locked in to the experience of the individual, it can be hard to use it to unsettle psychology's assumptions and practices because the discipline as a whole is very individualistic, you know, firmly centered on the experience of the individual rather than, say, the group level, the community level, or broader level of society. So IPA doesn't challenge those things about psychology. It sticks with the individual. Now, here's an example of analysis from the ETF 2008 article. It gives a good sense of how an IPA approach is interested in richly describing people's experiences. It tells a story about women's anger through the data. In this example, the authors are developing a narrative from the women's interviews to illustrate the emotions which accompanied anger and to illustrate the sub-theme of fluid and multiple emotions. So, <coughs> excuse me, you can see from this slide how we move from what the participant says to an interesting piece of analysis. Now pause the video if you need more time to read this slide, but I'm going to move on because time is not on our side. Now this is a further example. This illustrates quite nicely the IPA focus on the subjective experience of participants and its focus is particularly on psychological or individual explanations for what people are saying and experiencing. So the interpretive focus for IPA is more towards understanding the psychological and personal historical factors which shape women's expressions of anger and aggression. Now these interpretations draw on both the person's own interviews, uh, what they shared of their lives, uh, and also uh, psychological theories about the sources of deep anger, including grief and Im impotence. So that is, they're explaining why this account of aggressive fantasy f fantasizes about her husband, rather than, for example, an account about feeling angry with her daughter for dying or the circumstances that led to her death and the people involved in it. Now, this is another good example of how using an IPA approach you might interpret your data um, in a particular way. This example here illustrates further how the researcher draws on one person's interview as a whole to understand their expression of anger through aggressive fantasies. This also illustrates one of the limitations of an IPA approach. It doesn't draw upon social context and social conditions as a way to interpret the data. So in this article, although <laughs> Hello, Birdie. Hello, Birdie. It's a crested, uh, crested cockatoo, I believe. <laughs> so back to, back, to, back to what I was talking about. So in this article, although we understand anger more deeply as a complex emotional and physical experience that reflects the particular relationships, both past and present, in which people live, it doesn't give us a good sense of the wider social structures which are likely to shape the woman's expressions of anger through fantasies in terms of norms around feminine behaviour and expressing anger. Grounded theory. This is very commonly used but can be used in odd ways and often used badly. And this approach is very much more about social processes. It came from sociology. It's more sociologically precise alternative rather than psychology. So it's not so focused on the individual. Now the aim is to develop theory from data. So that sense of working from the ground up, bottom up, rather than top-down. Bottoms up, Simpson. There's plenty more where that came from. Now, in terms of the analytic process, it has a very structured approach to analysis. And you don't need to look into this just now, but just be aware that there's a very clear procedure for undertaking the analysis. And one of the most well-known features is the rule not to engage in the literature before you collect the data. What? <laughs> I know. Bonkers. <laughs> it... it, it one thing it's hard to do, it's really hard to do, because, because we can't really get a sense of what research needs to, to be done without looking at the literature to check that our planned research has not already been done. You know, if it's already been done, we're wasting people's time. So in assessment two, you'll be going through that process of looking at the literature, identifying a gap in the literature, and then developing a research question that addresses that gap. Now, some people say this rule about not going to the literature is a bad idea. But the general point really is that you should avoid going into the interviews, into interviews, say, with a head full of pre-existing theories. You know, if you know too much about what you are researching about, you can end up going in and inadvertently testing out your pre-existing theories. Those theories filter what you hear from the participant. I have too much stuff going on in my head. Is that the same thing? No. 
you know, you know, you have the, the trouble you, you the, <laughs> we have as psychologists, um, not you know we get this you know this theory of cognitive dissonance. It's hard for that not to come in our heads any time friends or family tell us that they're having problems making a decision. You know, we just go ah oh, cognitive dissonance stops us really listening to what the person's saying. Now grounded theory is all about developing categories or what is called also called clusters of codes and then you identify the relationships between those categories or clusters so it kind of produces things like mind maps you know that picture on the title slide for lecture four part one and also and for this lecture as well also one of those pictures on our units logo now the output of the analysis is similar to thematic analysis and ipa the analysis is very much about generating theory now the strengths of this approach is that it is useful for understanding social processes. It's also allow, it allows for very comprehensive analysis of the data and the procedure is quite clear to follow. Among the limitations are that because this type of analysis has been around for a long time, there are now many variations of grounded theory and this can be very confusing if you're new to it. You know, which variation should you use? Also, the focus is much more on social processes rather than psychological aspects of people's experiences. So some argue that it's harder to show the psychological relevance of your analysis. You know, that's a criticism that comes from mainstream psychology, mostly. It's not a criticism I would make. Now, it's also very time consuming. So it's not great if you have a short amount of pro uh, project time. It's also hard to adhere to fully. You know that problem of not looking at the literature before you, data, you collect your data? Um, it's really difficult to do that. In some ways, actually, you need to look at literature. So this means you often find inconsistency in how grounded theory is used or else some odd research happening when the principles of grounded theory are fully adhered to. You know, research that doesn't seem to be, uh, that seems to be somewhat misplaced or out of place because the research question has ignored previous work on the topic. Where the hell did that come from? Now, discourse analysis. This is my favourite. This is a really, really a whole approach to psychology, rather than just a type of analysis or a type of method or a type of methodology. It's also one of the hardest to get into. So I don't expect you to be able to understand these theories or to undertake discourse analysis at this level. So what we're gonna do here is just give you a little taster so you have an idea of what it might look like and allow you, um, yeah, just to get a sense of it. Now the textbook uses the analogy of how we might explain why a friend is drunk. An internal, inside the head explanation is that they're feeling sad because their relationship ended and that they failed their exam. You know, they're having a hard, hard time of it. Um, an external outside um, the person explanation might be that binge drinking is a socially normative way in a British or Australian culture to manage your emotions or that commercial imperatives result in the promotion of a binge drinking culture in universities. Now remember our article back in week two on heterosexual casual sex? This was a good example of a paper that was looking at external, outside of the person explanations for heterosexual experiences of casual sex. The authors were interested in how gender norms and heterosexual norms shaped these experiences. If, however, the authors had used an IPA framework for looking at heterosexual casual sex, then they would have explored it from a more psychological internal perspective. Discourse analysis works at that broader social and cultural and political level. At the heart of it is a view that the main topics of psychology, such as emotions, um, notions of the self, intelligence, and so on, are social activities that are created through language. They're constructed through discourse. Um, it's through people's use of language that we can understand these phenomena. Read it and become. Now, I just want to give you a very brief look at the two main forms of discourse analysis. For Coldian, post-structuralist and interpretive response. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I put the emphasis on completely the wrong bits there. Oh, talk about language use. Oh, God. <laughs> so we have the Foucauldian, post-structuralist and the interpretive responses. Now, beware, because language is so important, there is a tendency to use very precise words uh, to avoid language being misused in discourse analysis, which means that when you read about discourse analysis, you may often find it's a bit inaccessible because it uses words that are quite esoteric, you know, seldom used. They have, they're seldom used because they have, they have a very limited 
singular, precise use. You guys are nodding like you actually know what the hell he's talking about. So for Chaldean discourse analysis, named after the French philosopher and social theorist Michel Foucault, um, um, here discourse is a culturally available, shared pattern way of talking and thinking about an object. You know how, how, how we talk about the self? Uh, how do we talk about emotions? Um, you know, and so on. The approach holds that every time we talk about or describe something, we do so drawing on these shared discourses, and that more than one discourse exists for any object, but one or two will be dominant, you know, taken for granted as reflecting the truth about a thing. My way or the highway. The Foucauldian approach is interested in how particular discourses dominate other discourses through the way that power impacts on those discourses. Those who have power shape which discourses are available. Now, the textbook, the textbook uses the example of obesity to illustrate this approach. So, among the discourses that are available are uh, um, a medical discourse, discourse, obesity is a health risk, a moral discourse, obesity is due to flaws with the individual's character, a structural discourse, fatness is a Western phenomena linked to the economic and political system, and a pride discourse. Fatness is a positive identity. Now, the medical and moral discourses dominate in our culture, though there is a power struggle going on with this, with social movements promoting a structural or a pride discourse. But the medical discourse remains dominant because of the power of the medical institutions in society. Now, the second approach is interpretative repertoires. Theater just about pronounced I, just, I got away with that, I think. Interpretative. Why am I risking saying it twice? I don't know. Oh. Now, the idea here is that there are relatively coherent ways of talking about objects and events in the world. And this is similar to discourse, but the focus is on smaller, more specific and fragmented, fragmented things. The textbook has a nice way of describing this, which is that a discourse would be IKEA and a repertoire would be local stores. So there are many smaller locally available repertoires. Why can't I pronounce my R's? Repertoires that we may draw on to make sense of the world. Locally shared understandings that we tap into. Kind of like books in the library, endlessly available for borrowing. Here there's less of a focus on power and more of a focus on how people use language to create their world rather than how people are bound by broad discourses. So under interpretative repertoires, people are seen as more active in constructing their worlds rather than passive. So, strengths and limitations of discourse analysis. Well, theories about language offer new ways to understand social context. It's a new and interesting tool to put in our toolbox when it comes to research in psychology and it's developed methods for understanding how language is used and how it shapes reality. With Foucauldian discourse, analysis um, can be really usefully linked to politics, and there's been a great use of political uh, discourse analysis by political movements, such as the women's movement, the black movement, the disability movement, gay movement, and in particular, the psychiatric survivor movement. It also honours intuitive analysis and engagement rather than laying down a set of prescriptive rules in terms of how to do analysis. The limitations are that you really need to have a very good understanding of the theoretical framework of constructionism and critical realism. These are complex and challenging things, not just to say, but to read about. And it takes time to get it. And discourse analysis doesn't produce analyses that easily tra translate into lay language for giving back to participants or use, for use in applied research. The analysis, analysis can sometimes have trouble leaving the academy. It can be a bit too, you know, highbrow, you know? Okay, so that's this, that is this, that, this is that for, for this lecture. Too many this is and that. It's not a long one, isn't it? 24 minutes, oh God, over 20 minutes. Um, so, I'll see you in lecture five, where we'll talk more about data analysis that you're going to do, and um, we're going to get you started on some data analysis. You're not going to be assessed on this, but I want to get your hands dirty, give you a chance to have a go at data analysis, a qualitative data analysis. So, that's week eight. Till then, ta-da.